Welcome to another Human Red audiobook by the United Marxist Pact Discord server, link below in the description. In this series, we continue our investigation into the initial construction, the organizational structure, and the principles and tactics of the form of worker organization capable of seizing political power and establishing the revolutionary proletarian dictatorship and communality, which can in turn produce the communist mode of production through the shared class interests of the workers of the entire world. Our goal is to compile, analyze, and elaborate on what all these texts have to say about this, and at the end, have a strong understanding of the exact scientific process of this, particularly in general terms. At the end of our readings as a whole, we will try to put it all together and present it as a coherent whole in an educational video with associated notations. Today's text is on the tactics of the Communist International. And we have a pre-written analysis. This text tackles the question of what tactics Communist Party should take under different circumstances, advising on how to understand and put into practice some aspects of the International. The Communist Party must become the general staff of the revolution. And this requires the rejection of romanticization of revolution, which would result in the election of voluntaristic trailblazers and martyrs. Rather, it must gather itself around the proletarian army and be driven by real developments that actually struggle against current conditions. To do this, it should join movements of the working class to achieve their immediate interests while synthesizing the support for initial impulses with the ultimate goal and agitate, propagandize, and prepare alongside the masses. Through the support and education, the party develops the logical process of the workers on an accelerated basis, moving from individual struggle to trade union, worker council, and finally, political class party. This support for immediate interests involves being within the united front against bourgeois offensive. However, that involvement must maintain the party's independence and program, while rejecting any social democratic reformist positions that involve interests within the state. If we get involved in the state and reforms successfully go through via the state, it lulls the masses to sleep, believing that democratic mechanisms can achieve their aims. Thus, the Communist Party must not support entrance into them. Our response to the bourgeois offensive must be offensive in turn, as a defense only puts us on the back foot and trailing behind the masses. In the conditions of this offensive, the party must be able to take its developed theory, cognizant of correct tactical action, and put into praxis. The United Front means co common action by all labor categories, local and regional groups of workers and national trade union organizations, and it shows the path of the proletariat to emancipation, the communist method. In the United Front, the workers are driven to direct action guided by their class organizations resulting in the development of political consciousness, and thereby resistance to bourgeois state and opportunism. It consolidates the political party to have revolutionary consciousness of the path, and through inter immediate economic struggle, the masses are compelled to take political action. When this occurs, the party provides direction and a general staff. In short, a crisis of legitimacy is generated by pushing the proletariat to take action, and through that action, recognize the limits placed upon them by the bourgeois state. In the United Front, the Communist Party should constantly be preparing for the sudden but inevitable betrayal by the social democrat counter-revolutionaries by protecting themselves from infiltration by opportunists, keeping the program pure, and rejecting any calls by social democrats to stop the proletarian counter-offensive, while educating the workers on the need to keep the pressure going. When such occurs, the Communist Party will drive the workers to complete the assault, this time on the Social Democrats. For such a force to be possible, the party must put all resources of the whole proletariat on revolutionary terrain, which requires that the party's real unity be for the revolution, rather than the mere principle of unity itself. Any organization that rejects the revolution must be split with, and this ensures that the party cannot be diverted from the attainment of anything less than a revolution. Thus, collaboration with fractions of the bourgeoisie is impossible. While the party can support individual policies, entrants are aligned to organizations that would imply that the party is aiming at a democratic conquest of the state is impossible. Ultimately, parties should be recognized as communists or not on these grounds, 
Do they or do they not recognize bourgeois state machinery? Any party that voluntarily remains within the confines of the law, eschews violence, only works on bourgeois democratic constitutions, and or refuses the dictatorship of the proletariat is necessarily bourgeois. Ultimately, the platform of the party is 1. The proletarian trade union united front, 2. Unceasing political opposition towards the bourgeois government, and 3. Unceasing political opposition towards all legal parties. The Communist Party must always keep in mind its objective and subjective conditions. One major objective condition is the struggle by the masses based on economic motives without larger consciousness. This results in a subjective condition wherein an increasing number of the minority with a clear vision of the needs of the movement is developed. The development of this subjective condition requires the formation of a militarized school of thought. That school of thought is the political class party. The party is also an objective element in the material conditions, but until the decisive moment, it cannot manipulate the situation directly. It is only able to adjust the formation of the party's army. Objective revolutionary conditions generate groups for organizing alongside mass action in response to bourgeois attacks, and the best thing for the party to do in those circumstances is to be prepared to support these mass actions, converting them to the revolutionary path through education and the development of techniques learned through direct action. For this to occur, the party must be independent so it can take actions which will lead to the victory of the proletariat. The party must make it clear to the proletariat that is actively struggling against the bourgeois political military control apparatus in terms of guerrilla class war, direct action, and revolutionary conspiracy. With that summary put to the side, we will now begin our reading of the actual text itself. All right, welcome back to another day of United Marxist Pact reading sessions on the investigation of the worker organization that can bring about the dictatorship of the proletariat. Uh, so today we will be trying to get through the tactics of the Communist International and the Democratic Principle. In this case, the tactics of the Communist International is by the left current in the Communist Party of Italy, written in 1980, no, sorry. This is written in multiple dates, 11 to 9, 29 January 1922 and 12 to 31st January 1922. And it also appears to have a uh, foreword written in 1982. So let's get right into it. Presentation in Communismo, number 8, 1982. The text here published demonstrates the incompatibility of any kind of common ground between verbally revolutionary maximalism and communism. It was not actually three currents, reformism, maximalism, and communism, that confronted one another at Leghorn, as some would have us believe. The clashes between the social democratic current led by Tarati and the communist fraction based on the Marxist program and the programmatic theses of its third international. As social democracy performs a function of the long arm of the bourgeoisie within the working class, the maximalism, revolutionary only in word, was none other than the social democratic institution whose purpose, as Tarati was honest enough to admit, was to penetrate inside the Moscow International to weaken the program and soften its revolutionary objectives to the point of atrophy. As usual, the proof of its lies in the facts. The reformers and maximalists were unanimous in aiming their guns at the common enemy, revolutionary communism. The tactics of the Communist International were published in Ordine Nuovo on 12 and 31 January 1922, between the meeting of the Executive of the Communist International in December 1921 and the Congress of Rome in March 1922. This text outlined the positions of the Italian section of the International on all the complex international tactical questions facing the proletariat, including the correct position of the left regarding the tactic of the United Front. It helps once again to recall how the Communist Party of Italy, PCDI, was the first Communist Party to advocate the tactic of the United Front, by virtue of which it significantly extended its influence at the heart of the Italian proletariat. 
The theses on the United Front approved by the Executive Committee of the Communist International, ECCI, communicated a worrying shift in the tactics of the International, in effect challenging the position taken up to then in relation to the Social Democrats and even to parliamentary democracy. Hence, the PCDI's preoccupation with alerting the global communist movement to the dangers that lay ahead. Indeed, the Rome theses were the Italian section's contribution to solving the far from easy question of tactics. Nevertheless, the party strenuously defended the internationalist tactic in the face of social vilification, socialist vilification, writing out the smear, now to exult at its involvement in the pol politics of the common turn. But while the natural setting of the national and international congresses, it continued to reconfirm its exemplary discipline towards the directives emanating from Moscow, it simultaneously expounded with dialectical clarity the dangers which, given the objective exhaustion of revolutionary fervor, threatened to undo the marvelous historical work accomplished in the historical battles of the global proletariat during these years. Unfortunately, the alarm sounded by the left proved valid. From the exception made for the entry of the English Communist Party into the Labour Party, to mergers with other parties or wings of parties becoming the norm, through to the scandalous dissolution of the Chinese Communist Party into bourgeois democratic Kuomintang, from the parliamentary support, also considered an exception for a social democratic ministry, such as that of Brantings in Sweden, to the formation of a dubious quote-unquote government of workers and peasants in Germany, together with professional traders of the revolutionary proletariat, and finally to the support given to openly bourgeois governments. Okay. Uh, all right. Maybe that didn't work. No, it did. Where, where's our stuff? <laughs> I just expanded. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Sorry. I was scrolling in the wrong direction. Okay. The Tactics of the Communist International. Part 1. A lively interest is manifesting itself in many quarters in the tactical direction that the international communist movement is assuming in the current phase of the world crisis. It is no bad thing to clarify this question, but to reassure comrades who seem to be preoccupied with the symptoms of a supposedly new stance taken by the international, and to refute, and this is very easy, adversaries who are attempting to speculate on a revision of methods which reconciles the methods of the communists with those, partially stigmatized and fought against, of opportunists of every type. Let us therefore present, on the one hand, the current status of the question as expounded in the debate and in international preparation, together with the true meaning of the tactical proposals which have been articulated, and on the other hand, our party's point of view on the subject. It will be useful to say in advance that the decision of the issue is, from the international perspective, currently under review and discussion, and that any decision is reserved for the meeting of the Enlarged Executive Committee, which will take place in Moscow on February 12th, and that the opinions of the Central Committee of our party can be deduced from the text of the theses on the tactics adopted by it, which contain the elements of an organic contribution to the solution of the current tactical issue. It cannot be ruled out that the point of view of the Italian party may be different from that of other communist parties, but this is not mean to say that the aforementioned idiocies of the opportunists cannot and should not be rebutted, by showing how their ignorance and lack of sincerity appears even more ridiculous when applied to a risible display of artificial puritanism, or when they misinterpret the results of the magnificent superior experience of the communist movement as renewed respect for the nonsense they have been rambling on about for so long, all the characteristics of the their incapacity in, in, in their impotence, and of their sorry profession as publicity agents for the slanders contrived in counter-revolutionary circles. The Third Congress of the Communist International has not pronounced on the tactical issue of the proposals for a proletarian united front by the Communist parties based on the platform of immediate and contingent demands. The Congress's internal discussion on tactics was characterized from a rather negative perspective, 
the critique of the march for action in Germany and of the so-called tactic of the offensive. Based on its judgments of this action and its results, the Congress came to a series of conclusions concerning the relationships between the Communist parties and the proletarian masses, which in their guiding spirit are the common patrimony of all Marxist communal communists when applied in a healthy and faithful manner. To the masses is a watchword of the Third Congress, and signifies a rebuttal of all the insinuations of the opportunists. Since the magnificently realistic point of view of the Third International has nothing in common with a revolutionary sleight of hand, that would entrust the transformation of society to the voluntaristic and romantic mission by an elect legion of trailblazers and martyrs. The Communist Party will become the general staff of the revolution when it knows how to gather around itself the proletarian army, driven by the real developments of the situation into a general struggle against the present regime. The Communist Party must have the largest part of the proletariat behind it. Okay, so let's take this bit here. Oops. And we're going to post this here. Okay. So the demands of to the masses has nothing to do with the calls for the simplification or weakening of the requirements for the organizations to be combined in the international. It, to recall for anybody who is confused about this, in the previous piece, party and class and class action, it was all about you know, whether or not the party should be opened up or have its uh, uh, membership requirements loosened, especially at times where it's difficult to get more members in because, you know, the mood of the masses isn't, isn't aligned with socialism. It's not like recognizing the direness of the situation. They instead say, no, you should not seek this sort of Puritanism or this sort of alignment with anybody who happens to come a-calling. Instead, keep steady, keep increasing discipline, and so on and so forth. Eventually, the mood of the masses will change, and you need to be there having been steady and with your hands on the wheels and ready to take charge of, well, Charge is the wrong word, right? To put things into the hands of the workers when the decisive moment comes. And as I said, it's very evident that this thing was written before, you know, <laughs> um, fascism, right? Um, just because conditions get worse and, and, you know, socialism starts to get popular doesn't mean that a bunch of people calling themselves socialists can't come in and take all that present a counter-revolutionary uh cause in revolutionary language to confuse the proletariat and just completely destroy us um so so yeah it, it's important to just be aware of that i'm not saying to reduce the requirements of the party i'm saying that the party needs to re-gear itself um in its struggle against this and be more active about it i'm not sure exactly the answer to dealing with this and maybe we'll see it later but um we're struggling to deal with quote-unquote maga communists today That's going to keep on happening, and it's going to be worse in the future. So we need to be prepped for that. And we don't even have an organization that can fight against that, right? We don't really have any unified or disciplined or anything along those lines. Um, party that can get up and say, no, these guys should not be listened to or anything like that. Um, we have a bunch of disparate freaking YouTubers like me. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, this is a very real danger and we need to think about what it is that we're doing in preparation and how to keep people from falling into this garbage. 
Okay. Uh, back to the text. Oh, I'm sorry. Actually, no. So the Communist Party will not become the general staff of the revolution by relying on voluntarists or an elect legion of trailblazers and martyrs, but rather by gathering around itself the proletarian army and being driven by real developments and recognizing the actual state of affairs. Okay, back to the text. Entrust these ideas to elements who do not possess the profound critical dialectics and true application of Marxism, elements which may also be in the ranks of the Communist International, who are certainly not among its leaders, even if some stupidly accuse them of being right-wing. And you will see how erroneous conclusions are drawn, which truly deserve to be spoken of as steps to the right or as retreats into outmoded attitudes. It is necessary to have the masses, and it is necessary to have the Communist Party, resolute and adapted to the revolutionary struggle, free from social democratic and centralist de and centrist degeneration. That means, you know, saying, oh, you know, we want to be part of this other thing because they got the numbers, so let's, uh, let's just weaken our thing and meet them in the middle. No. <laughs> uh, anyway. These two conditions are perhaps, or indeed certainly, difficult to achieve because it is tremendously difficult to resolve the problems from which the transformation of the world will arise. But they are not two mutually exclusive conditions. So it would be sheer follow to make a simple democratic interpretation of Lenin's expression, we must have the majority of the proletariat. An interpretation that would shift the basis of the Communist Party and alter its character and function. Because only a because only is it thus possible to include the majority of the masses. The undeniably Marxist content of the international thinking is precisely the opposite, that the conquest of the masses and the formation of authentically communist parties are the two conditions which, far from being mutually exclusive, combine perfectly, so that by developing its tactics towards organizing large proletarian strata, the communist international does not renounce, rationally develops and employs its own work towards breaking the proletarian political movement away from the traitors and incompetents. A further fundamental concept brought to light by the Third Congress also refers to the most authentic sources of our Marxist thinking and our revolutionary experience, and it can only be regarded as a novelty by those who understand revolutionism in the sense there is only one certain means to protect oneself from venereal diseases, which is masturbation. <laughs> <laughs> in order to protect the species' reproductive organs, one must renounce their function and reason for existence. What a quote. Okay, I didn't expect to read that. Uh, okay, we would say instead that the Revolutionary Party must participate in the movements of working class groups in pursuit of their temporary interests. The task of the party is to synthesize these initial impulses with the general and supreme action for revolutionary victory. This is achieved not by despising and ch da childishly denying these in initial stimuli towards action, but by supporting and developing them in the logical reality of our process, harmonizing them in our confluence with general revolutionary action. So let's say, let's give an example, right? Um, the The... Hollywood strike. Should communists support that? The answer is yes. We should support that and then go and talk to the people who are on the ground and talk about the necessity for communism and develop their revolutionary consciousness. Whatever you might think about their individual um, small trade unionist uh, consciousness, the only way that, that's the initial starting point. That's the development of the proletariat. You move from the individual to a trade union consciousness to a general um, recognition of the working class as a whole to an internationalist perspective, right? So you, you, you've got to go, the proletariat is going to go through these steps and they'll be like, well, that didn't work. So what we need? Okay, we need to broaden. Well, that didn't work. Well, okay, what we need? We need to broaden over and over and over again. In addition, by getting ourselves involved with these sorts of struggles, we develop ourselves. We get, you know, uh, we learn more about the struggle. We learn more about how to protect ourselves and how to organize and so on and so forth. 
Uh, these are all things that Lynn talks about in his was to be done. We will be going back and reading that, but we did, uh, we did read his where to begin, which is kind of the prequel to what is to be done. And he talks specifically about this. That doesn't mean, of course, that we should be going in and supporting right wing reactionary shit. That's no, we we need to combat that even if it comes carrying the colors of the workers or anything like that. Actually, if it's carrying the colors of the workers, then that's the exact sort of thing we need to be fighting the most against. Um, okay, so where were we? Oh, yes. It is in these problems that the dialectical content of our method shines forth. Resolve the apparent contradictions of the successive phases of a process as it comes to fruition, and, in discerning in its life and its dynamics the historical progress of the revolution, it has no fear of declaring that, while tomorrow we ne will negate today, it does not cease to be its progeny, which means more than simply being its successor. The dangers of such work are obvious. Communists are unanimous in considering that in order to overcome them, it was necessary to constitute genuine revolutionary parties free from every opportunist vice. The formula with which the Communist International will crush reformism goes far beyond a dignified refusal to place its feet in the territory trodden by reformism. Quote, Do you have this recipe? The amusing champions of the intransigent left of the Italian reformist party seem to be asking. We may well reply that we are developing it, having fir discovered the first and most important agreement. Ingredient, the liquidation of centrist and seratist equivocation. All right, so again, it's not denying reformism. Um, it's saying that you have to transcend it. Um, it's not denying immediacy. It's saying that you have to be laying the groundwork So we're going to take this, I'll post it there. So the Communist Party should join movements by the working class to achieve their immediate interests. However, they should synthesize these initial impulses with the ultimate goal and agitate and propagandize and prepare for it with the masses. The Communist Party develops the logical process of the workers, the, from the individual economic struggle to trade union economic struggle, the industrial union economic struggle to the political class party. Uh, actually, rather industrial union, let, let's say worker or council uh, to the political class power party uh, through the support. While doing so, it does need to protect itself from opportunism. We can't find ourselves saying this is where we're aiming for this individual or trade union economics. Or, no, it's always got to be leading ultimately to this thing, the political class party, and to this thing, the ultimate goal. Okay, back to the text. All the elements of this kind of discussion and the proof on these fundamental tactical concerns, there's nothing that the most orthodox and extremists amongst us cannot subscribe to will more, merge more and more clearly in the preparation for the debates on the question of tactics at our Congress. Turning now on to the current execution of the tactics of the international, let's remember that the previously mentioned tactic of the United Front, although it has not been sanction, sanctioned by a third Congress, was nevertheless previously broached in the well-known open letter from the German Communist Party to all the political and economic organizations of the proletariat, calling for common action for the realization of a series of postulates reflecting problems of immediate interests to masses. Today, the German Party seems willing to go further, raising questions in the field of government policy, presenting its position with regard to the constitution of a parliamentary-based proletarian government, which we will discuss in the following discourse. However, while we await the, the this this would be the SPD, by the way. However, while we await the decision to be taken by the Communist International, which no doubt will correctly specify the meaning and terms of this, and before indicating in what 
since we viewed a solution and having also, we may say, tried it out in our party's practical activity. We would like to make use of the text of this speech that Comrade Zeno Zinoviev gave at a meeting of the executive on the International on December 4th, 1921, on the subject of TAN, to draw out from this same speech by the President of the International, the proof that it is impossible to speak about any reason for attenuation or correction, or even cite contradiction between the current direction and the glorious global communist tradition. In, in other words, no, um, it, it's a universal thing. You, you can't go off on your own for national uh, thing. Anyway, all right, Zinoviev first examines the state of the issue with the various parties of the international and thus explains the meaning of the United Front formula in relation to aspects of the current situation around the world in order to establish the basis for an international application of such tactics. It is clear from Zinoviev's statement that all the tactical considerations being developed at present are based on the platform of the fundamental assertions of communism, which is a basis for the renewal of the international. The renewal in this case, of course, refers to the break between the second international, which is filled with opportunism and social chauvinism, and so on and so forth, and the third international, which was... Um, which was demanded in response to that and the support various quote unquote communist parties had for their own nations in um, World War I. Today, more than ever, com communist militants maintain the necessity of having a centralized and homogenous communist party as the organ of struggle and are ready to embrace the most severe disciplinary measures to achieve this objective. More than ever, they maintain that only the revolutionary armed struggle and the dictatorship of the proletariat are the paths to revolution. More than ever, they are convinced that we are experiencing a revolutionary crisis in capitalist society. The question is how we influence this development through the action of the Communist Party in the struggle for dictatorship. We can find and propose various solutions to this problem, but remains for all of us the one direct op objective of our efforts. Whatever tactic we propose, says Zinoviev, the first condition for its useful application is safeguarding the absolute independence of our party. For this reason, we do not propose mergers. As you will see, we do not propose blocks or alliances either. It is a matter of patiently pruning away at the simplicity of certain opinions and highlighting cases in which such simplicity hides a guilty and insidious duplicity counterposing the honest complexity of our methods to their games of means and ends. Zinoviev goes further, responding directly to opportunist speculations regarding some of our fundamental assertions. Far from rejecting previous splits, we are also prepared to further splits if necessary, since those have only ever increased our freedom of action, allowing us to ride out of situations most difficult twists and turns, without ever losing sight of our revolutionary goal, which the opportunists have bartered away a thousand times to bourgeoisie in exchange for services rendered, even if under cover of the most extreme demagogic proclamations of independence and rectitude. Far from modifying the kind's point of view concerning the use of armed military force in the revolutionary battle, our comrades' writings claims that the German march action as being authentic revolutionary action bearing good results. All of the considerations and conclusions that he advances as possible consequences of the March Act are guided by the concept that it is a matter of developing and accelerating in the preparation of the final struggle for the proletarian dictatorship and that using for this purpose the spontaneous movement of that greater part of the workers, who still do not clearly distinguish the ultimate objective, does not imply a refusal to denounce those who peddle the illusion that the emancipation of workers can be achieved in other ways as traitors to the proletariat. We continue, says Zinoviev, with the work of crystallizing our parties, in which a social democratic lie is denied citizenship. And not even in our dreams do we renounce criticism of the opportunists, of the various yellow internationals. The yellow in this case means class collaborationist. 
so yellow union for example collaborates with it with the bosses and yes it receives better conditions but the a union is supposed to allow for the workers to withhold their um labor through force if necessary <clears throat> a yellow union on the other hand finds itself on the side of the bosses in support of them and it may allow a strike to go through, but only at the behest of the employer. Okay, anyway. He also clearly states that our view of the present solution, characterized by the capitalist offensive, is that presents obvious revolutionary tendencies, such as a proposal of a defensive tactic for the whole proletariat nukes no sense at all. It should amount to renunciation of the revolutionary struggle, to be satisfied with maintaining the present condition of the proletariat. Whereas on the contrary, to address this immediate problem, we consider it necessary to introduce a counteroffensive by the masses, placing them, excuse me, placing them on the path of action, always supported by the Kais parties and only by them. It is no coincidence that the reformists, gradualists, and pro-unity gentlemen are today opposed to our modest immediate demands, and sabotage the united front of the masses. They know that we all want to sit because in the way we extend our program's development by crushing their methods and their defenseless and defeatist organization. All right, this is a good uh, piece right here. But I'm going to finish this here. But it's not enough to show that Zinoviev declares it as adherence to those positions we hold in common. We can and must. And this will be the subject of a subsequent article, show how he has the right to declare the deductions he has drawn from them to be both coherent and logical, even, even if we are proposing differences in the detail of their application. All right, so yeah, this is in support of organizing the United Front under the following conditions. Number one, the capitalist is on the offensive. They are actively seeking to crush us because we've developed and we've successfully pushed out the social democratic factions and so on and so forth. The, and rather than going on to defense, instead we should engage in a counteroffensive. So, um, and actually attack, right? Uh, and in that case, the uh, masses must be supported by the Communist Party and only by it. The offensive against the Communist Party will necessarily involve an assault on the proletariat because in a properly organized Communist Party, we kind of are the proletariat, right? So we can take advantage of that if we do things right. That, that's basically what's being argued here be on the offensive while the enemy is on the offensive okay Back. and and when we have successfully organized to be capable of taking an offensive action uh, which involves getting rid of reformist liquidationists and so on and so forth anyway back to the text part two in a preceding article we insisted that the tactical initiative supported by the communist international today which are summed up in the formula of the proletarian united front do not imply any renunciation by their proponents of the fundamental directives of the communist movement which have been affirmed and in particular have been opposed by the equivocal man maneuvers of the social democrats we have proved this with zinoviev's own words it would not be difficult to do the same with the explicit statements of these comrades who put forward proposals that seem more risky such as those from the headquarters of the German party and from Rotfan, Rotfain. However, actually, I'm not sure this is a SPD. No, yeah, it would be the SPD that was demanding that. And then who was it that was calling for the United Front against fascism? And did that involve United Front alongside the SPD? I don't know. We'd, I'd have to look more deeply into history. A anyway. However, our adversaries may object that such verbal declarations of fidelity to principles have no other purpose than to disguise a conversion to the right. 
while the tactical proposals with which we are concerned contained in themselves a contradiction with the directive followed until now by the Communist International, with its previous position towards the Social Democratic parties. But this is not true, and even if one believes, from the Communist point of view and within our own camp, that these proposals, or at least some of the ways in which they are applied, are reprehensible, no one has a right to maintain that we are facing a crisis of principle within the world communist movement, or that we need to recognize substantial errors in the method we have so far supported. With the enormous sum of theoretical and practical collaborations, of which the Third International is proud, the revolutionary method has passed forever from the initial embryonic stage of abstract declarations and simplifications to face the tests of real world in all its formidable complexity. Tactical problems are now understood in a more concrete sense, whereas previously the positions we assumed were chosen solely on the basis of their propaganda and educational effect of the, on the masses. Today it is a question of having a direct impact on events. With the degree of influence of tactical positions requiring requires a sophistication and capacity to overcome apparent contradictions, which is always already perfectly contained in the dialectics of the Marxist method. The simple critique of reality is completed in its actual demolition. Yesterday, adapting to it was tantamount to renouncing the one's activity we could engage in to overcome it. Today, it could mean seizing reality to subdue and conquer it. The powerful beam of a lighthouse cuts through the darkness in a magnificent straight line, but can be stopped by the most fragile screens. The flame of the blowtorch licks docilely at metal, but only to soften and melt it, passing victoriously to the other side. Okay, we're going to take this because this is an interesting um, thing, right? They are saying that, hey, we've done all the education necessary now it's time for action um we, we we've we figured things out the workers are already familiar with things to a sufficient degree now we can move forward because our tactics have been tried and tested and so on and so forth or if people have seen the oppenheimer movie it says theory can only take you so far Right, that's the common that's the common watch word in that movie, and I'm pretty sure it was in real life as well. So, um, you know, that's what they're saying here. Hey, we have developed the theory and we have prepared. Now it's time to take material action and then see what happens. <clears throat> so before the party is developing tactics had to be built around education and propaganda. Now the party is developed enough to take that developed theory and put it into practice, or praxis, as the term goes. Okay, back to the text. There is no Marxist who does not stand by Lenin in denouncing as an infantile disorder the criterion for action which excludes certain possible initiatives based simply on the consideration that they are not sufficiently straight and aligned within the formal schema of our ideas with which they clash and create unsightly de deformations. That the means can have aspects which are contrary to the ends for which we adopt them lies at the heart of our critical thinking. For an end that is superior, noble, and seductive, the means may appear wretched, torturous, and vulgar. What matters is being able to calculate their effectiveness, and whoever does so simply on the basis of appearances sinks the level of a subjective and idealistic view of historical Kazakh causalities, which is somewhat Quakerish. It ignores the superior resources of our critique, which is today becoming a strategy, and which is brought alive by the brilliant, realistic understanding of Marxist materialism. So basically they're saying, hey, listen, no revolution is made with uh, white gloves. And, it, and consequentialism is correct, because, you know, we live in fucking reality. And to sit by and do nothing in the face of the brutal exploitation that the proletariat receives is tantamount to having the blood on your own hands anyway, if you've got the power to do something about it. So you better fucking get up and do something about it. Anyway, 
Are we not the ones who know how dictatorship, violence, and terror serve as specific means for the triumph of a social regime of peace and freedom? And are we not the ones who cleared the field of ridiculous liberal and libertarian objections, which only attribute to our method the capacity to establish dark and bloodthirsty oligarchies, because it is conditioned by the outward characteristics of the methods adopted? You know, the, the regular old, um, you know, fascists use political violence and communist political violence and anarchists use political violence. Therefore, fascists, communists, and anarchists are all the same, right? <laughs> it, it's very silly. Anyway, as there's no serious argument that can rule out the utility of adopting the bourgeoisie's own method to defeat the bourgeoisie, so it's not possible to deny an a priori that the adoption of the tactics of the social democrats cannot defeat the social democrats. We do not want to be misunderstood, and we will postpone an explanation of our thinking until later on. And those who want to understand its main outlines, in any case, only need to study the, our theses on tactics. When we say that the field of possible and admissible tactics cannot be restricted by considerations dictated by falsely doctrinal and oversimplification, metaphysically dedicated to formal comparisons, and preoccupied with purity and rectitude as ends in themselves, we do not mean that on the field of tactics should remain boundless, and that all methods are good to achieve our purposes. It would be an error to entrust a different resolution of the search for suitable methods to simple considerations that there is an intention to use them to achieve communist objectives. You would only be repeating the mistake which consists in rendering an objective problem subjective, having contented yourself with the fact by if you choose if you choose, prepare and direct initiatives, you have decided to struggle for Connie's outcomes and allow yourself to be guided by a ladder. So, yeah, it's basically saying, yeah, there's going to be violence and stuff like that, but it doesn't mean anything fucking goes. If you're aiming for communist ends, that means that your method should be guided by communist uh, methods, right? And then we have to ask ourselves what constitutes is that i don't think it's particularly important to put this in here but i am just going to for the sake of completion yeah. the tactics and use of the revolution will not be will be determined by Connie's theory which is not ignorant on what correct a tactical action um just because there's violence doesn't mean anything goes okay there exists, and therefore it can always be elaborated better, a criterion that is profoundly Marxist and anything but infantile, which sets the limits to tactical initiatives. It has nothing to do with the preconceptions and prejudices of a mistaken extremism, but the criterion which arrives at another path at the useful core cast of the otherwise complex links connecting the tactical expediences we apply to results we expected from them. Zinovev says that the precisely because we have strong parties that are independent of opportunist influences, we can risk applying tactics that would be dangerous if our preparation and maturity were weaker. It is true that the fact that a tactic is dangerous is insufficient reason to condemn it. It is just one of the considerations that must be applied to assess it. It is really a question of judging the element of risk in relation to the possible benefits. On the other hand, as the Revolutionary Party's ability to take the initiative grows, the maturing situation tends to, in general, to carry its effort forward in an increasingly precise direction, making the outcome of any action more clearly apparent. In short, in the analysis of the tactical proposals that are presented today, it is necessary to avoid hasty oversimplification. This alone can lead one to say that the German Communist Party, by proposing joint action with the independent and majority Social Democrats, repudiates the reason for its formation through splits from one and the other. As soon as you consider that matter, you identify an infinite number of differences in new perspectives, which are in fact more important than any formal reconciliation. First of all, Zinoviev usefully observes that an alliance is not the same thing as a merger. The organizational split for certain political elements can make it less difficult to do some work with them. Then there's this, that proposing a united front is not the same thing as proposing an alliance. 
We know what is meant by political alliance in the vulgar sense. You sacrifice or keep quiet about certain parts of your own program in order to meet halfway. But the tactic of the United Front, as understood by us communists, does not contain the elements of renunciation of our part. They remain only as a potential danger, which we believe, we believe becomes preponderant if the base of the United Front is removed from the field of direct proletarian action and trade union organization and encroaches on that of parliament and government. And we will say for, the, for what reasons connected to the logical development of the latter tactic. Okay, so we're going to take this and put this here. All right, so the United Front does not demand alliance or the meeting of halfway in programmatic terms, but it does hold the risk of these if trade union organization and direct proletarian action successfully influences bourgeois democracy because in the proletarian is like, hey, look, we won by working together and then demanding the proletariat and the, or rather the Communist Party, you know, enter into their coalition or whatever, that they get into the parliament. So, yeah. Anyway, back to the text. The proletarian United Front is not a banal, about a banal joint committee of representatives of various organizations, in favor of which communists relinquish their independence and freedom of action, barring it for a degree of influence over the movements of a larger mass that would follow it if they acted alone. It is something completely different. We propose the United Front because we feel certain the situation is such that it, the joint movement of the proletariat as a whole, when they pose problems are not of interest to just one category or locality, but to all of them, can only achieve their aims by taking the communist road. That is to say, the road we would take them down if it depended on us to guide the entire proletariat. We propose the defense of immediate interests and the right existing conditions of the proletariat against the bosses' as attacks. Because this defensive, which has never been at odds with our revolutionary principles, can be made only by preparing for and launching the offensive in all its revolutionary ramifications, just as we intend to do. Um, in such a situation, and we won't repeat here the considerations uh, that would be required to demonstrate that a degree reached this point of maturity relating to the economic and political manifestations of the capitalist offensive. We can offer an agreement whereby we do not demand that the other parties accept, for example, the method of armed action or struggle for the proletarian dictatorship. But if we do not demand this, it is not because we think that it is better for the moment to renounce it all and be satisfied with less, but because it is useless to formulate such proposals when we know that carrying them out would be constrained simply by having to agree to defend the modest objectives of the demands that would serve as a platform for the United Front. You know, we, we have to be able to continually demand more we, and not just be like, hey, we got what people wanted, we're going home now. No, our goal is to propagandize, to produce a crisis of, um, of uh, uh, what do you call it, legitimacy for the bourgeois state. Um, and show that it's unable to actually attain what the proletariat actually desire, which is the abolition of private property. Um, we need to be continually developing revolutionary consciousness, not taking these these small crumbs. You know, I've been told before that I'm ungrateful for the things I have. I'm like, this is frankly incredible. Isn't the whole concept of accumulation that you should always desire more, right? The capitalists should profoundly agree with everything that a member of the Communist Party is saying here. When they're saying, no, never take what's given to you by the bourgeois state. Instead, always demand more, 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 right? Why in the nine hells would anybody just stop? Simply because they've won some small thing. I, I'm only asking for the fucking world here, right? And that is literally it. I'm only. I'm not asking for more. I'm not asking for, you know, 
to become a god king or whatever. I'm asking for the all the things that the proletariat have made to be put into the hands of the proletariat. Our our demands are the ultimate for modesty. It's just that was part of those demands. <laughs> that is to say, the toppling of the tyrants of humanity is some of the most incredible form of demands. So, yeah. Anyway, continuing. As soon as our understanding of the dialectical basis of this situation is deepened, we see that all the intransigent and simplistic objections completely collapse. Quote, an alliance of the defeatists and those who betrayed the revolution to support the revolution? End quote. Explain the appalled communists of the fourth international stamp. Or the centrist bootlicker the type between the second and the third. But let's not dwell on this terminological exercise or even say that we are infallible communists. We know what we are doing. Everything we do is assuredly inspired by its revolutionary purpose. We can even negotiate with the devil. On the contrary, let's respond with a critical examination of the situation and the developments that may arise from it, which will soothe our fears that things will go as the devil wants. The Marxist left currently always supports supported intransigence and had a thousand reasons to do so when the reformists proposed alliances with particular bourgeois parties. Such alliances would in fact have had the certain effect of paralyzing the organic development of a party capable of revolutionary propaganda and, in subsequent situations, of revolutionary preparation and action, while its results would have effectively marked out a path for the proletariat which, being just a blind alley, simply used up its energies in supporting bourgeois order. There is no question of renouncing this intransigence today. In the first place, collaborating with bourgeois parties and collaborating with parties whose members are recruited from the proletariat, and the implicit condition that they renounce the bourgeois bloc is not even formally the same thing. And it is not even a collaboration that one wants to establish with such parties, but a very different kind of relationship, on the basis of which the Communist Party does not divert its attention and effort away from its own revolutionary objectives to focus on lesser ones hoping that the social democratic rev counter-revolutionaries can embrace this goal with a turn to the left, half reformist and half revolutionary. Rather, it is based on the conviction that we must continue to fight for the communist program and that the opportunists will continue to work for the counter-revolution, the purpose being to generate a situation from which there will emerge a struggle in which the entire proletariat is behind the communist line, after which the opponents opportunities will have been, been definitively unmasked, having been brought face to face with their own promises of gradual and peaceful conquests. Right. So basically you're saying, okay, yeah, you know, the these we enter into this United Front and the and the proletariat wins this stuff and then what happens? Uh then the opportunists go and say, oh, well, no, let's not continue. But the workers, if they are properly educated, will say, no, let's keep fucking going. Just like I was saying, right? No, no, no sane person is just going to say, okay, we've, we've got all these wins doing the same exact tactic. Let's keep on doing it. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Then somebody gets up and says, no, you know, We've got high enough wages, right? We've got enough worker rights. We've got enough breaks and stuff like that. We, we don't need any more. <laughs> How about everybody just go home, right? With properly educated, no worker will accept any of that claptrap. You know, no worker is going to accept the claims that, oh, higher wages means everything costs more in inflation. That's bullshit. It's been debunked for 200 fucking years. But people keep bringing it up. They keep repackaging it. Iron law wages in my ass, right? And that's what we have to do. We have to say, no, these people are fooling you. These people are lying to you. And they're saying that they, all this crap in order to make you so you go home. Because they are not actually on the side of the workers. They had their 
initial small goals that aren't enough for everybody. So let's keep on going. And guess what? We're the only ones arguing for that. So you should get behind our camp because we're going to lead you to victory. And yeah, the reformist parties will betray us. That's, that's their nature. That's always been their nature and always will be. Um, I don't know how fucking annoying is that, but it's the truth. But if we're properly prepared, if we recognize that uh, sudden but inevitable betrayal, insert the um, meme, then ideally there shouldn't be real threat, especially if we have the workers behind us. Okay, okay. So the Communist Party should be prepared for the sudden but inevitable betrayal by social democratic counter-revolutionaries. Course of the United Front, because we do not get infiltrated by opportunists and our program remains in place. When the Sogdoms call for a stop to the proletarian counteroffensive, we should have properly educated the workers to not accept these calls for police. Instead, the workers get behind us and we complete the assault, this time on the Social Democrats. Um, so, okay, uh, back to the text. The definition of the precise terms of the United Front tactic is therefore a delicate issue for communists. It is necessary to be able to translate into practice, and is necessary to guarantee that it does not deviate from these, those characteristics that not only make it compatible with our objectives, but it is also shown to be the working towards them in a situation like today's. All of this can and must be discussed, having done justice to the fears of certain Puritan old maids, as well as a bland complacency of the highly experienced prostitutes, who predict for others the same downfall as their own. Gosh. These, these, these uh, examples. <laughs> um, before we proceed to the final part of this treatise, where we will express our own point of view, we do not want to pass over the expositions on this subject made by other comrades and organizations of the Communist International before commenting on, further on the spirit that emanates some of the other documents that appeared later on. A new article by Raddick, quote, The Immediate Task of the Communist International, which completes his other paper, quote, Before the New Struggles, and also two official documents, Manifesto of the Workers of All Countries by the Communist International and the International of Red Trade Unions, and the theses the, adopted by the Executive Committee on the session of December 18th, which will be published in our newspapers in full. Again, the basis for all discussions and decisions regarding the tactics to be followed is not all a retreat from the positions on which the International fights. More than ever, it is a case of... Uh, case of opening the road to victory of the proletarian revolution on, on the only path it can take, the violent overthrow of bourgeois power and the establishment of the proletarian dictatorship. The problem consists in bringing forces able to prevail over the defensive counter-revolutionary resources of the world bourgeoisie onto the terrain of the struggle for the dictatorship. These forces can only be drawn from the ranks in the working class. But in order to defeat the capitalist adversary, it is necessary to concentrate the efforts of the entire proletariat on revolutionary terrain. This has always been the fundamental role of the class party, according to the Marxist point of view. This means achieving real, not merely mechanical, unity. It means having unity for the revolution, not unity for itself. This objective is achieved by following the path embarked on, the so, re on so resolutely by the Third International after the war. Concentrating in the ranks of the Kai's parties the elements to have a conception of the revolutionary necessity of the struggle, that do not allow themselves to be diverted by the attainment of partial and limited ends, that do not want to collaborate in any situation with fractions of the bourgeoisie. Based on this initial platform, and having passed judgment on a whole range of degenerations within the movement, these elements constitute the nucleus around which the effective unity of the masses is achieved in a progressive process whose speed and ease depends on the objective situation and the tactical capabilities of the communists. Hmm. Should this be added? Uh, yeah. We're going to add this here. All right. 
So the party must put all resources of the whole proletariat on revolutionary terrain. This requires real unity for the revolution, not for unity itself. So in other words, don't be unified just because unity good. Instead, be unified because around the end goal of establishing the dictatorship of the proletariat and then the con and then world communism, right? Um, this real unity makes it so the party cannot be diverted by the chain of anything less than a revolution. So it doesn't matter if you get some reformist stuff or not. Um, like, <laughs> think about freaking champagne socialists um, who are like, who, who only want uh, free health care. And then as soon as they get it, they'll go home. They'll go back to brunch, right? What what's what's the use in allying with them? Well, here's the use. The use is to temporarily ally with them so that we can educate some people. <laughs> anyway, it makes it to collaboration with fraction of the bourgeoisie is impossible. Okay, back to the text. In these articles, Radek does not even remotely put any of this in doubt. The tactical resources he puts forward are those that he says may be needed, given the current situation, to push broad battalions of the proletariat into the struggle for revolutionary dictatorship. We have seen how the general situation is characterized by the capitalist offensive against the conditions of life of the proletariat, because capitalism feels that it cannot avoid catastrophe without stepping up the exploitation of the workers. At the same time, the capitalism depresses the masses economically by means of economic and political offenses. It takes the opportunity to pursue its own reorganization. But equally, by accentuating the character of industrial imperialism, it moves towards the abyss of another war. This is the unanimous communist judgment of the situation, the consequences of which the, is ur the urgent need for the proletariat to respond with a rev revolutionary counterattack and to speed this up and to speed this up and, uh, i think that was a uh, mistake to speed this up is necessary to identify the ways in which the development of such a situation can be used for revolutionary ends from this it follows as we have seen that even a purely defensive economic struggle of the proletariat poses a problem of revolutionary action and the crushing of capitalism why was it not revolutionary to demand a significant increase in wages in the past, whereas today it is revolutionary to demand that they are not reduced? Because the first action could be pursued by limited local and professional groups of workers in a haphazard way, whereas the second action, which has become necessary today, and which is the only one possible unless the proletariat renounces all forms of association and organization, requires all the workers' forces to take to the field beyond sectoral and local divisions, and indeed on a worldwide scale. Like, you know, they're individual... Well, okay, it's interesting, right? In America, we've got the minimum wage, and if individual workers go on to strike, or, or rather, trade unions go on strike, they can win higher wages than um, minimum wage. But if the workers of basically everywhere went on strike, would the federal minimum wage increase? Probably. Maybe. I'm not sure. Um, so maybe that's kind of what's needed. Maybe we need to create such pressure that the minimum wage goes up really high and then... Um, it can't, and then individual workers or unions can't agitate for higher wages because there's no wiggle room for the bourgeoisie. And then that will force the um, proletariat to seek larger organizing. Just a thought. Um, anyway, back to the text. The old formal and federalist unity of traditional social democracy, which barely disguised the divisions and groups of interests and separate movements under the cloak of empty rhetoric, including divisions into national proletarian parties, is yielding its position in the decisive period of capitalist evolution to the true unity of the working class, which is irresistibly leagued to a harmonious 
centralization of the world proletarian movement. The Communist International has already given this movement the skeleton of unitary organization as well as the soul of revolutionary theoretical consciousness. The proletariat is still divided as regards ideas and political opinions, but there will be unity in action. Do we claim that unity of doctrine and political faith must, according to who knows what abstract criterion, receive unity of action? No, because that would turn, be to turn on its head the Marxist method, which we staunchly support and which tells us how, from the effective unity of the movement created by the dissolution of capitalism, there must necessarily arise a unity of consciousness and political doctrine. This realistic approach to the unity of all workers in concrete actions will also win their unity in the profession of their political faith, based on communist political faith, and not simply on a shapeless jumble of current political trends. That is to say, we will gain the unity of action by means of revolutionary postulates of communism. Um, hold on, let me, let me take a look through this real quick. So all of us are willing to make whatever sacrifices are needed to move things forward at this favorable juncture. It is a question of having understood the situation well and of taking into account that its later phases will involve a long road ahead. Braddock proposes a united front of the proletariat not only to address the problems of resistance to the capitalist offensive, but also to address the question of government. He is referring to the situation confronting the German proletariat. In Germany, there is a special economic situation, not because a barrier separates it from the rest of the world, but because the processes that characterizes the global crisis find its focus in what is happening in the German-speaking countries. Let's speak of the formidable problem of the reparations that must be paid to the victors. The German productive class is making an incalculable effort to pile up products destined for foreign markets in order to realize the value of war reparations, that must be paid to the intent. But this is only achieved by means of the most shameless exploitation of the proletariat. The German government, whoever it is, must concern itself with this supreme problem, where to find the billions needed for reparations. The entire fragile edifice of the attempted capitalist reconstruction rests on the solution to this problem. Radek appears to be convinced that if a workers' government were formed on the basis that is a German capitalist who must pay, rather than the workers and other poor social strata. This would bring about a situation in which the only outcome would be the struggle of the German proletariat for the dictatorship and the sabotage of the bourgeois world program. This necessity is felt by the German proletariat only in a superficial sense, at least by a part of it that identifies with the social democratic parties who are strong in parliament. Therefore, the proletariat pushes them into power. If they take it, the problem of civil war will arise. If they do not, the masses will abandon them. But they could, not fi but they could find a way to save their opportunism with the following argument. That the communists are preventing them from making this bold gesture, thereby creating an alibi for collaboration with the bourgeoisie. Radek believes it would be, a good idea, would, would be good to take away this alibi. We grant him this opinion, but we insist on the fact that even the German comrades who act in this way would not have lost sight of the directives for the maximum communist goals. And what is more, by remaining insistent on this point, they, we are setting another goal. To have encouraging many of our comrades, especially the young and audacious, to despise a simplistic laziness that can take refuge behind a preconception or a cliché without penetrating the complexity of the tactical arguments arising from an analysis of the current circumstances, thus depriving themselves of the most effective means of intervening in a debate of this type, and engaging in the enormous work of preparation that is needed to avoid the falling into an ever-present trap of opportunism. Finally, with respect to the official documents of the International, we shall restrict ourselves to pointing out that the manifesto is addressed neither to the parties, or to the trade unions, uh, organs, or the other internationals, but to the proletariat of all countries. The very fact that the workers adhering to Christian and liberal unions are invited to join the United Front demonstrates the difference between the two concepts. Nobody would think that of a United Front with Christian and liberal parties. And if, on the other hand, the theses of the Executive Committee for now avoid making a general theoretical framework for the question, 
they establish some very important points, such as the organizational independence of our communist parties. And not only that, but also their absolute freedom as they embark on the unified front, united front initiative to criticize and take issue with the parties and the organizations of the Second International and the Second and the Half International. Freedom to act on the field of ideas for our very own specific program. Unity of action of the entire proletarian front. So, so basically, again, the United Front requires us to maintain complete independence, requires us to be able to propagandize while within it, and say what we want to say. Um, we should not have to give up any points on our program, and if we do, then it's a no-go. Okay. This apparent contradiction or change of position is neither a novelty nor a useful, unusual conclusion. The party's view of it must be robust and all-encompassing. Among the masses, it must be conducted with infinite precaution and a sense of perspective. By propagandizing its most salient aspects and gradually developing its mechanism, which will be laid bare by the facts themselves, it is inevitable that the masses, setting out with this superficial notion, by their moving towards a split or towards unity. Imagine that the two directions are opposed to another, but in reality it's not like that. The unity of the workers and separation from degenerate element, and especially from treasonable leaders are, on the contrary, two parallel victories. We have known this for a long time, and the masses will only see it at the end of the exercise. What is essential is that this should be understood in the sense of the struggle, of the resistance against capitalist impositions. So, you know, we're people who don't understand are like, oh, well, why don't you just ally with them? You know, you, you want a lot of the same things. And it's like, yeah, but check out this key bit here, right? It's kind of like if you were asked to ally with a rapist, right? Yeah, he's he's got a lot of good points. He's handsome, he's he's charming and, you know, he's rich and stuff like that. Yeah, but he's a rapist. No, I, I'm not gonna I'm not going to collaborate with somebody like that. No. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, I, it's just it's in political terms. Anyway, Freedom and independence of organization and internal discipline, of propaganda, of criticism, unity of action. This is what communist parties must put forward and achieve in order to win. Okay. That is short and to the point, and it needs no uh, summary. The formal juxtaposition is no more than what has always been expressed by our slogan, Workers of the World Unite. Thanks to this, we have unmasked as traitors those who divide the proletariat during the war, who divide it in the day-to-day -day activity of the trade unions by preventing the thousands of disputes and struggles that are currently taking place from merging into one. This juxtaposition is not only the reason that we are in favor of a more severe political selection, but also the reason we are for the unity of a union organization, a conception and tactic that the party can verify through day-to-day -day results, since the positive progress of our struggle against the Italian reformist opportunism is a result of our tactical position, according to which after the political split of Livorno, we were determined to remain in the trade union organizations, in spite of being directed by the reformists with whom we had separated, and stayed there to combat them effectively. The problem, therefore, must be considered on two levels. The Communist International does not return to yesterday's work but reaps its rewards on this path, which leads to the double result of having a revolutionary political movement at the head of the proletariat and having the entire proletariat rally around its banner. Okay. Okay, part four. In the preceding articles, we set ourselves an explanatory purpose to describe the current status of the question of the United Front in the presently much debated official documents of the Communist International and statements of certain communist parties and comrades. At the same time, we have sought to get our readers to identify with the methods which, in order to deliberate on such questions, 
must be adopted if we wish to live up to the historical and tactical experience of the Communist International and permanently arise above the mental laziness of oversimplification and the practical sterility of actions driven by phobia of formal preconceptions. And through this exposition, we have re wished to reclaim the right of these comrades of ours to develop their tactical plans, so that we are judged to have adopted a very different stance to the highly despicable one adopted by the opportunists, who wait in vain for Kanye's to give up the firm and solidly revolutionary content of their thinking and their action. We now will now briefly express our thinking, which is rather more than its personal capacity, since we will be referring to the exhaustive discussions which have taken place on the subject of the executive committee of our party, to provide the mandate to the comrades who will represent it at the forthcoming meeting in Moscow. It will be no mystery to anyone that the thesis defended by the Italian communists will be somewhat different, or if we want to use the old expression further, quote unquote, left, than, the, than that represented, for example, by Radek and the support of my comrades in Germany. Let us indicate to all comrades, especially the young and generically quote-unquote extremist, how much greater the weight of our party's contribution to the discussions about the difficult problem will be if we show that our divergence is not born of particular misunderstandings, but of an examination of the question conducted with perfect consciousness of its limitations, taking into account all the elements from which other comrades' is thinking is deduced without entrenching ourselves in absurd denials of certain conclusions which would convince no one. And we reaffirm this incontrovertible fact of before all. There is no danger of the Communist International abandoning, albeit minimally, the platform of the revolutionary Marxism, from which it has issued its war cry to the masses of the world proletariat against the capitalist regime and all its supporters and accomplices, great and small. We refer comrades to that analysis on the present situation, on which we all undoubtedly agree, which summarizes the diagnosis of the bourgeois offensive as a result of this phase of, in the crisis of capitalism. We also say that we definitively accept, insofar as our tactical conclusions are based on the Marxist method, the thesis that agitation and revolutionary preparation is mainly done in the field of the proletariat struggle for economic demands. This realistic view explains the tactics of trade union unity, which is fundamental for us communists, to the same degree as our ruthless distancing ourselves from any hint of opportunism in the political field. In the same way, the tactical position that our party upholds today in Italy, with the campaign for the United Front of all workers against the boss's offensive, is timely and very successful. In this instance, the United Front means common action by all labor categories, all local and regional groups of workers, all national trade union organizations of the proletariat, and far from signifying a muddle of different political methods, it goes hand in hand with the most effective way of winning the masses over to one political method that shows them their, the path to their emancipation, the communist method. Doctrine and practice converge and confirming that no obstacle or opposition is found in the fact that, as a platform of mass agitation, concrete and momentary economic demands are formulated, and as a form of action, a movement of the proletariat as a whole is proposed in the field of direct action, guided by their class organizations, the trade unions. The direct result of all this is an intensification of the ideological and material training of the proletariat for the struggle against the bourgeois state, together with the campaign against the false counselors of opportunism of every hue. These are long paragraphs, sheesh. And, and yeah, it, it's kind of going through my head, and I'm sorry for anybody who's listening to this recording. With tactics delineated in this way, leaving aside the varieties of applications that can be thought of as dependent on the various situations in the various countries of proletarian parties and trade organizations, we find nothing that would compromise the two fundamental and parallel conditions of the revolutionary process. That is to say, on the one hand, the existence and consolidation of a solid political party founded on clear consciousness of the path of, to revolution. On the other hand, the growing combination of the great masses, 
impelled instinctively to action by the economic situation and the struggle against capitalism, a struggle in which the party provides direction and a general staff. Uh, okay, we're actually going to take this and we're going to do insert row below. Actually, do we need this as well? Uh, da, da, da. I find it's common action. Okay, yeah, we're going to take this as well. And we're going to go like that, dot, dot, dot. Okay. Um, so the United Front means common action by all labor categories, local and national groups of workers, and national trade union organization. It shows the path of the proletariat to emancipation, which is the communist method. The workers are driven to direct action guided by class organizations, their trade unions, which results in the development of political conscience because the proletariat is trained against the bourgeois state and against opportunism. It consolidates the political party to have revolutionary consciousness on the path of the path, and the economic struggle at the same time compels the masses to take political action, which ultimately the party provides direction and a general staff to. Okay, continuing. With tactics delineated in this way, oh, I'm sorry. When we wish instead to examine the influence of our and our common objectives to facilitate and accelerate the victory of the proletariat in the struggle to overthrow bourgeois power and institute the dictatorship of any of other tactical pr approaches, such as one proposed by the Communist Party in Germany and set out in articles by Karl Radek, Approaches which entail plan of action for the proletariat to intervene in the political mechanism of the democratic state. It must be noted that the characteristics of the problem, and therefore the conclusions to be reached, change radically. The picture presented by Radek is based on clear analogies with that of the situation of capitalist offensive, from which we set out to define our tactic of the single trade union front. We have the proletariat, which sees its exploitation being massively intensified by employers owing to irresistible influence of the general situation on the latter's action and the pressure it exerts. We communists, the comrades who are with us, know perfectly well that the only way out is through divine and overthrow of bourgeois power. But the masses, through a limited degree of political consciousness, and because their mood is still influenced by the social democratic leaders, do not see as an immediate way out and are not taking to this revolutionary path, even if the communist party wants to set them an example. The masses think and believe that some kind of intervention by the state authorities could solve the acute economic problem. Therefore, they wanted a government which, as in Germany, decides that the burden of war reparation must fall on the class of the great industrialists and business owners, or else expects the state to implement a law on the working hours, on unemployment, on workers' control. As with the case of demands to be obtained by trade union action, the Communist Party should embrace this attitude and initial impulse of the masses and join with the other forces that propose or talk about winning advantages by means of the peaceful conquest of parliamentary government and setting in motion the proletariat on the path of this experiment in order to profit from its inevitable failure with a view to provoking the proletarian struggle on the basis of overthrowing bourgeois power and the victory of the dictatorship. Okay, so, uh, yeah, more generate a crisis of legitimacy by standing, by pushing the proletariat forward to take action, then letting them recognize the chains on them when they try to move. <laughs> because, you know, if the Communist Party isn't helping out, what happens? Well, the proletariat's like, well, I guess we just didn't do it hard enough, or we, we, we screwed up, and it's like, no, we, we're, we're, we're right there, and then it didn't happen. <laughs> Uh, so why it didn't happen? Well, it's because th these people who we told you not to trust 
um, and not to support did the exact things that we said that they would do. Um, yeah, you maybe learned a lesson. It's like a parent who's, whose kid says, hey, can I smoke? And then they're like, okay, sure. And they give them a cigarette, and then the kid has a terrible experience. And it's like, have you learned a lesson? Okay, maybe you'll trust me next time. <laughs> All right. We believe that such a plan is based on a contradiction and in practice contains elements of an inevitable failure. There's no doubt that the Communist Party must also resolve to utilize non-conscious moods of the broad masses and cannot restrict itself to negative, purely theoretical preaching when it is faced with a general tendency towards other paths of action that are not specific to its own doctrine and practice. But this utilization can only be productive if, by placing itself on the terrain on which the broad masses move, and thus working at one of the two factors essential for revolutionary success, we are sure that we are not compromising with no other no less indispensable factor, which consists of the existence and progressive strengthening of the party, together with having an organization of the part of the proletariat that has already been brought onto terrain where the party's slogans are having an effect. Um, so it's critiquing this position that I was just talking about earlier. In considering whether this danger does or does not exist, it should be borne in mind that, as long as painful historical experience teaches, the party as an organism and the degree of its political influence are not inviolable, but are subject to all the influences of events as, it, as they unfold. If one day, after a more or less prolonged period of struggles and incidents, the working masses should finally array thrive at the vague realization that any attempt to counterattack is useless unless it fights against the bourgeois back against the bourgeois state apparatus itself. When the earlier stages of the struggle of the organization of the Communist Party and those of the movements on its flanks, such as the trade union, the military organization, had been seriously compromised, the proletariat would find itself deprived of the very weapons it needs for its struggle. The indispensable contribution of the minority that possesses a clear vision of the tasks that need to be carried out, and which, by holding on to this vision over a long period, has undertaken the indispensable training and equipped itself with indispensable weaponry, in a broad sense of the term, that is needed to ensure the victory of the broad masses. We think this would happen, demonstrating the serality of all tactical plans like those we are examining. The Kai's party overwhelmingly and blatantly assumed a political stance that annulled and invalidated its inviolable character as a party in uh, of opposition in relation to the state and other political parties. So, in other words, um, um, the Communists Communist Party could not support workers demanding from the state to receive um, support as it would involve the feigning of belief in the um, bourgeois order. Uh, I, I kind of question this. I understand what they're saying, but um, times are overwhelming, blatantly assumed political stance and nulled and validated. Does this though? Does going in and saying, okay, yeah, go ahead and try and we'll support you, but you're going to fail. Does that really count? Oh, no. Anyway. Um... We'll see what they have to say. We do not, we believe we are able to demonstrate from both critical and practical perspectives that this thesis has nothing abstract about it, nor does it derive from that desire in the context of this complex argument to create arbitrary schemas. Rather, it responds to concrete and exhaustive assessments of the subject. The Communist Party's stance on active political opposition is not doctrinal luxury, but as we will see, a concrete condition of the revolutionary process. 
In fact, active opposition means constant preaching of our theses on the inadequacy of all action directed towards conquering power by democratic means, and that all political struggle that would like to remain on legal and peaceful terrain, fidelity to the sense being exercised through constant criticism of the work of governments and legal parties, while avoiding any joint responsibility for it. Through the creation, drilling, and training of the organs of struggle that only an anti-legalist party such as ours can build, outside and against the mechanisms that is solely there for the defense of the bourgeoisie. This method is theoretical insofar as indispensable that a leading minority should possess theoretical consciousness. It is organizational insofar as, while the majority of the proletariat is not mature for a revolutionary struggle, it provides for the constitution and education of cadres for the revolutionary army. In this respect, loyal as we are to the radiant tradition of the Communist International, we do not apply to the political parties the same criterion we do to the trade union organisms. That is to say, we judge them not on the basis of the recruitment of the numbers and the class terrain on which they recruit, but on the basis of their attitudes towards the state and its representative machinery. A party that voluntarily remains within the confines of the law or can conceive of no other political action than that which can be developed without the use of violence against civil institutions of bourgeois democratic constitution, is not a proletarian party, but rather a bourgeois party. And in a certain sense, the mere fact that a political movement, even those that take those that place themselves outside the boundaries of the law, like syndicalist and anarchist movements, refuses to accept the concept of the state organization of the proletarian revolutionary power, i.e. the dictatorship, is enough for us to deliver this negative judgment. At this point, we can only say that the platform defended by a party, proletarian trade union, united front, unceasing political opposition towards the bourgeois government and all the legal parties. We will cover developments within our organization in the next article. Okay. Let's get this to here. Okay, so organizations are judged to be bourgeois or proletarian based on whether or not they recognize bourgeois state machinery. Any party that A, voluntarily remains within the confines of the law, issues violence, only works from the bourgeois democratic constitution, or refuses the dictatorship of the proletariat is necessary, necessarily bourgeois. And the party plan form is ultimately proletarian trade union f united front unceasing political opposition towards the bourgeois government and towards all legal parties back to text um we will cover developments within our organization in the next article we do not however want to admit to mention yeah, that parliamentary and governmental collaboration are completely excluded from the moment that we adopt such a platform we nevertheless do not renounce, as you will show, a much better and less risky use of the demands that the masses are led to make in the form of requests to state authorities to other parties, insofar as they can be supported independently as outcomes to be achieved by means of direct action, external pressure, and criticism of the policies of government by all other parties. Okay. Um... Fortune part five is not exactly short, but we'll get through it. Okay. We wish to conclude these notes of ours, rendering the discussion of the problem at hand and taking into account factors that were only just emerging with the presentation of the arguments that support the position assumed by our party's executive committee, according to which the proletariat's unity of action must be pursued and carried out on the basis of the policy of opposition to the bourgeois state and the legalitarian parties, a position which the Communist Party must, must develop ceaselessly. If the repetition of some essential points had not helped in setting up out our position, they in no way harmed the intended purpose to draw all comrades full attention to the delicate and complex terms of the problem under discussion. We would like to point out that there's a useful distinction to be made between the subjective and objective conditions for a revolution. The objective conditions consist in the economic situation and the direct pressure exerts on the proletarian masses. The subjective ones refer to the degree of consciousness and combativeness of the proletariat, and above all, its vanguard, the Communist Party. 
An indispensable objective condition is the participation in the struggle of the broadest layer of the masses, directly spurred on by economic motives, even if for the most part they have no consciousness of the development of the struggle in its entirety. A subjective condition is the existence, in an increasingly numerous minority, of a clear vision of the needs of the movement going forward, accompanied by readiness to support and direct the final phases of the struggle. Let us admit that it would be anti-Marxist not only to pretend that all workers involved in the struggle had clear awareness of its development and a strong-willed orientation towards its aims, but equally anti-Marxist to seek such a quote-unquote state of perfection in every Communist Party militant when the subjective conditions for revolutionary action reside in the formation of a collective organ, the party which is at one and the same time a school in the sense of a theoretical tendency, and an army with the corresponding hierarchy and relevant training. We actually, they already said this in a previous one, but I think that this says it quite well, so I'm, I'm just going to put this in here. We're not going to summarize it, because we've already done that before. But we believe that it would fall into subjectivism, no less anti-Marxist, because it is voluntaristic in the bourgeois sense. If the subjective conditions were condensed into the enlightened will of a group of leaders, who could take the forces of the parties and others over it which exerts an influence down the most complex tactical paths, regardless of the influence exerted on these forces by the development of the action itself, and the method chosen to take it forward. This is because the party is not the invariable and incorruptible subject, the enactor of abstruse philosophies, but is in its turn an objective element of the situation. The solution to a very different, difficult problem of party tactics is not yet analogous to problems of a military nature. In politics, you can adjust, but you cannot manipulate the situation to your like, liking. The facts governing the problems are not our army and the enemy's army, but the formation of the army from indifferent strata and from the ranks of the enemy itself, and as much as on one side as the other, where hostilities are taking place. I'm going to take this. Also, not going to summarize it yet. The best use of the objective revolutionary conditions, without any danger of ignoring the subjective ones, indeed with the certainty of developing them brilliantly, arises from taking part in and spurring on the mass actions around economic and defensive demands, which are prompted by the boss's offensives in the current state of the capitalist crisis, as we have already said. Thus, by supporting the masses and following the impulses uh, they already feel in clear and powerful way, we lead them along the revolutionary path we have marked out certain that we will overcome the subjective conditions rage, range against us, and that the masses will be faced with the need to fight for the revolution in general, for which our party will provide them with a theoretical and technical tool set, which, which, which the struggle itself will improve and enhance. Our party's independent political position will allow it to carry out, in the course of the action, the ideal and material revolutionary preparation which has been lacking in other situations, even if they are also impelled the masses into struggle, because of, among other reasons, the absence of a minority, differentiated with regard to revolutionary consciousness and preparation for the decisive force struggle. I'll get that as well. This, this last section is full of uh, good stuff. Well, it's more summarizing things that were already said in previous works. Anyway, the bourgeoisie's defensive strategy is to oppose a proletarian revolution with subjective counter-conditions, offsetting the op objective revolutionary pressure born of the difficulties and obstacles of the world crisis, with the resources of a political and ideological monopoly over the proletariat's activity, through which a ruling class attempts to mobilize a hierarchy of proletarian leadership. Right, so basically because they control all the labor and uh, and propaganda and so on and so forth, they're trying to um, give subjective shit um, through like nationalism and 
and and stuff like that but they can't change the objective conditions which are the economic ones because they're so tapped um anyway <clears throat> Through the organizations of the Social Democratic parties, a vast section of the proletariat is trapped by bourgeois ideology, the lack of revolutionary ideology. We refer here not so much to the ideological conception of individuals, but rather the tendency to act collectively on the basis of a firm line and an organization of struggle in the political field. The bourgeoisie and its allies work within the proletariat to spread the conviction that violent methods are not required in its struggle to improve its standard of living, and that peaceful employment of the democratic representative apparatus within the orbit of legal institutions are weapons it should use. Such illusions severely undermine the chances of revolution, because at a certain point they are bound to fail. But at the same time, such a failure will not cause the masses to lend their support to the struggle against the bourgeois legal and state apparatus by means of the Revolutionary War, nor proclaim the support and support the class dictatorship, the sole means of crushing the enemy's class. The proletariat's reluctance and inexperience in the use in the use of these crucial weapons will be entirely to the bourgeoisie's advantage. Thus, the task of the Communist Party is to destroy among as many proletarians as possible, this objective repugnance towards the delivering the decisive blow against the enemy to prepare it uh, for what will be required to take such an action. Uh, okay, we're going to take um, this. Uh... Back to the text. Although it is fanciful to pursue this task by means of the ideological preparation and drilling in class warfare of every single proletarian, it is nevertheless indispensable to ensure it by developing and consolidating a collective organism whose work and behavior in this sphere represents an appeal to the largest possible part of the working class, so that by possessing a point of reference and support the inevitable disillusionment which will eventually dispel the democratic lies, will be followed by an effective conversation to the method, conversion to the methods of revolutionary struggle. In this sense, we cannot win without a majority of the proletariat, that is, while the majority of the proletariat is still on the political platform of legality and social democracy. The Third Congress stated as much, and it was right. But this is precisely why we must make sure that these tactics are adopted in such a way that, within the movement of the masses, which are provoked by objective economic conditions, there is progressive increase in the number of adherents within this minority who, having Communist Party as a nucleus, nu nucleus, nucleus, have based their action and preparation on anti-legalist terrain. Uh, can I get this? No, it's just restating stuff that it's already saying before. From the critical point of view, and from the real practical experiences that we possess, nothing stands in the way of transition from the action of the broad masses for demands that capitalism neither wants to, nor is able to, concede and against which it will deploy the open reaction of both regular and irregular forces, to the action for the total emancipation of the working class. Because both the one and the other have become impossible, without the overthrow of the bourgeois political military control apparatus, against which the workers are led, whereas the Communist Party has already organized itself for the struggle against it, bringing together a section of the masses, a party which has never in, in the course of the struggle concealed the reality that we must struggle against forces of this nature, it has taken upon itself the first phase of the battle by means of guerrilla class warfare through direct action, through revolutionary conspiracy, Okay, this is actually important part, especially for this last bit. Um, okay. On the other hand, everything leads us to condemn as something very different and with an opposite effect. The attempt to transfer the front of the broad masses for an action which, even though it has objective demands that are immediate and accessible to masses, takes place on the political platform of legal democracy. To an action that is anti-legalitarian and for the dictatorship of the proletariat. 
Here, it is not about changes in objectives, but about changes in the plan of action, of its organization, of its methods. Such a tactical conversion is only possible, in our opinion, in the man's under condottieri who have forgotten the equilibrium of Marxist dialectics. Imagine that they are already working with an army perfectly drilled and trained automa, automatons, rather than with tendencies and capacities that are still in the course of being developed among elements who need to be organized, but who are always prone to relapsing into the inconsistencies of individual and decentralized actions. The path of the revolution becomes a blind alley of the proletariat in order to realize that the multicolored facade of liberal and popular democracy conceals the iron bastions of the class state were to proceed to the bitter end without thinking to equip itself with an appropriate means of demolishing the last decisive obstacle. Until the point when the ferocious forces of reaction, armed to the teeth, emerge from the fortress of bourgeois domination and throw themselves against it. The party is necessary to revolutionary victory inasmuch as it is necessary that, well before it, a minority of the proletariat starts shouting incessantly at the rest that they must take arms for the final battle equipped and training themselves for a naval struggle. This is precisely why the party, in order to accomplish its specific task, must not only preach and show through reason arguments that the peaceful and legal path is an insidious one, but must prevent the most advanced section of the proletariat from being lulled to sleep by democratic illusions, and assign it to formations which, on the one hand, begin to ready themselves for the technical requirements of the struggle by confronting the sporadic actions of bourgeois reaction and on the other hand get themselves a large success section of the masses close to them, used to the political and ideological requirements of decisive action through unremitted criticism of the social democratic parties and defying against them inside the trade unions. The social democratic experiment is bound to happen in certain situations and should be utilized by communists. But one shouldn't think of this utilization as an act which happens at the end of the experiment, but rather as a result of an incessant critique, which would have been carried out by the Communist Party, and for which a clear separation of her responsibility is indispensable. Hence our idea that the Communist Party can never abandon its position of political opposition to the state and to other parties, since we consider this to be part of its work of constructing the subjective conditions for the revolution, its very reason for being. A communist party confused with the pacifistic and legalistic parties of social democracy in a political, parliamentary, or governmental campaign no longer absolves the functions of the communist party. At the end of such a phase, objective conditions will present a fatal predicament of the Revolutionary War, the imperative of assaulting and destroying the capital state machine. Subjectively, any hopes placed by the proletarian in bloodless and legal methods will have been disappointed, but will lack the synthesis of objective and subjective conditions, which the independent preparation of the Communist Party and of the minority that had managed to gather around itself would have supplied. The situation will rise no different in practice from that which the Italian Socialist Party experienced on many occasions when it had consisted in them of opposing tendencies. The masses disappointed by the failure of the reformist methods expect a slogan that never arrives because the extreme elements do not have an independent organization, do not know their strength, are sharing responsibility with the various reformists in the face of general distrust while no one has thought of charting the features of an organization that can function, struggle, and wage war, just as the implacable prospects of civil war looms large. For all these reasons, our party states that there should be no talk of alliances with the political, the political front with other parties, if they do call themselves proletarian, nor subscribing to programs which imply participation by the Communist Party in the democratic conquest of the state. This does not exclude the possibility of proposing and backing claims, achievable through proletarian pressure, which would be enacted by means of decision of the political power of the state, which the social democrats say they want to and can achieve through the latter. Since such action does not reduce the level of initiative that the proletariat has achieved by direct struggle. Let me get this. For example, one of our demands for a united front 
to be supported with the national general strike is assistance for the unemployed by the industrial class, industrialist class and by the state. But we refuse any complicity with the cheap trickery of the concrete programs of the state policy proposed by the Socialist Party and the reformist trade union bosses, even if they were to agree to propose them as program of the workers government instead of one they dream of in a respectable and fraternal collusion with the parties of the ruling class. There is a great difference between supporting a measure, which we could call reform in a parody of old debates, from inside or outside a state, a difference which is determined by how situations evolve. With direct action by the masses from the outside, if the state is unable or unwilling to give way, you arrive at the struggle to overthrow it. If it does give way, even partially, the method of the anti-legalist means of action will be valorized and practiced. Whereas with the method of reconquering it within, if that fails, like the plan that's being advocated today, it is no longer possible to count on forces capable of attacking the state machine, their process of aggregation being an independent nucleus having been interrupted. The action of the broad masses in the United Front, therefore, can only be achieved in the context of direct action and cooperation with the trade unions in all places and of whatever category and tendency, and is, it is made up to the Communist Party to initiate this agitation, since the other parties, by supporting the inaction of the masses in the face of the provocations of the ruling and exploiting class, and by diverting it into the, onto the legal and democratic terrain of the state, have shown that they have deserted the proletarian cause, allowing us to push to the maximum the struggle to lead the proletariat into action with communist directive and with communist methods, upheld alongside the humblest section of the exploited, who just want a crust of bread or are defending it against the insatiable greed of the bosses, and also against the mechanism of the current institutions, against whoever places themselves on their terrain. And that is the end of the Tactics of the Communist International, all part, five parts. That was actually the longest that we have done a reading. Um, and that's a bit too long for my interests. Um, in the future, in ideal terms, what we'll do is after a session, I will go through and actually present the analysis at the end of the video we're, we're not we're not going to do that i realized that that would be a good thing to do but it was just too long but in short this has been essentially about the concept of a united front what the dangers are, what the benefits are, how to go about it um, it's been a rejection of any sort of um support of engagement within uh any kind of state organization outside of very specific circumstances and along with an interesting definition of what constitutes as a proletarian versus um bourgeois organization so it was a very useful and interesting piece Lots of stuff that was also repetitious of previous stuff and internally as well. So apparently it was multiple um, publications just collected. So it makes sense because they're reminding people of the previous stuff. With that said, that is the end of our session today. Tomorrow we will get started on the democratic principle, which is by the Communist Party of Italy again, and that will probably take about an hour. After that, we will get to Gorder's open letter to Comrade Lenin, uh, which is going to take at least one um, session on its own. But with that said, I want to thank everybody for coming, and I'm going to stop recording now. Have a great day.